Okay, well, it's good to be here again to share with you from God's Word, and the chapter is Judges chapter 20, and I want to read the first 17 verses of this chapter. Uh, the theme that we're going to be dealing with this morning is civil war, and we might bear in mind the words in Galatians, lest ye bite and devour one another, <laughs> that you also may be consumed one of another, and that's really what's happening here. So beginning in verse 1, it says, then all the children of Israel went out and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew sword. And the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were going up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, tell us, how was this wickedness? Then the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent. Neither will we any of us turn into his house, but now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot and against it, and we will take ten men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand, to fetch a victual for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. And the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? Now, therefore, deliver us the men, that the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed, Every one could sling stones at an hair breadth and not miss. And the men of Israel beside Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men that drew sword. All these were men of war. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word to us. I'd like to give us the outline first, just so we know where we're going in this chapter. And again, I want to just say this, that um, the outline is not original with me. And just to acknowledge that every one of us, we're all gleaners. We're all those that have benefited from either oral ministry or written ministry. And so I'm not claiming any originality. Uh, I'm very indebted as well to those that, um, that I've studied and read that have been a tremendous help to my soul in understanding these things. And so verses one through seven, we have an, the explanation of the Levite. Uh, they want to know, well, tell us all about this. They've just got this interesting parcel post of a part of a woman's body, and they want details. And so the, ex the explanation of the Levite. And then from verse 8 down to verse 14, you have the escalation of the trouble. And the trouble's just getting stronger and stronger. Verse 15 through 17, we get a description of the extent of the armies. How many do Benjamin have? How many do the rest of the nation have and then from verse 18 down to verse 46 you have the engagements with benjamin and there are there, there are three engagements two of them are very unsuccessful and then a third one 
proves to be successful, the engagements with Benjamin. And then the final two verses, verses 47 through 48, you have the effects of the slaughter. And of course, it's quite devastating. There are lessons we can learn in this chapter. Uh, one of the things we want to keep at the back of our mind, we're going to do some parallels with 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to think about assembly discipline, because really this is, this is discipline of the congregation of Israel, but it wasn't handled very wisely. And so often, sadly, assembly discipline is not handled very wisely either, and actually ends up causing devastation rather than really dealing with the issue. And so uh, we might say, uh, this chapter, you could write over it, assembly discipline, how not to carry it out, <laughs> how not to do it. Sometimes we learn more from people's mistakes of how not to do things than actually from clear teaching telling us how to do things. We can say, well, we don't want to do it that way. Uh, that's definitely not the way to do it. Just by way of introduction, we want to see that these this final section of judges that really began in chapter 17 goes to 20 chapter 21 it really deals with the effects of individual sin on the whole and so we saw in chapter 17 and 18 that what began with one man's idolatry ended up being the idolatry of an entire tribe the first institutional idolatry in the nation of Israel. So from one man's idolatry, Micah and his house, you ended up with a whole tribe uh, now giving themselves to idolatry. And in this section, again, one man's lust, this man who was lusting after his concubine who'd played the harlot and went after her, we're going to see that it's going to affect the whole nation and actually almost result in the, the wiping out of a tribe in the nation of Israel. And we need to just remind ourselves, sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. James 1.15, sin when it's finished. And we need to remind ourselves that sometimes we'll say, well, if I do this sin, I'm not affecting anybody. It's just me. No, 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 no. That's a deceit of the devil. Your sin always has a knock-on effect that will affect others. And it's always the case. And so we, we have to recognize we're not an island. Uh, my sin affects others. Achan's sin, uh, maybe he thought to himself, this is not going to affect anybody else, but it resulted in defeat for the entire nation. And so we need to be just examining our hearts and saying, am I involved in, in willful sin? And if I am, the consequences are not just going to affect my life. It's going to touch the lives of others. And that's the lesson we get from these lots of chapters of the book of Judges. So we, we want to begin with the explanation uh, by the Levite. And we notice it says in verse 20, then all the children of Israel went out and the congregation was gathered together as one man. And so it's the first sign of unity we find in the entire book of Judges. They're together as one man. Sadly, it's deceptive because it isn't the whole of the children of Israel. There's one tribe missing. Uh, that tribe is Benjamin. And later on, we'll see that also they, those of Jabesh Gilead were not there either. So tragically, this one man's sin affects the whole of the nation. The whole nation is now engaged in this matter. What the Levite should have done, and it would have taken courage, but he should have gone to the elders of Gibeah with his complaint rather than telling all Israel. See, when it would deal with sin, we need to contain the problem, right? We need to contain the problem, not broadcast it. It shouldn't be something that we, we broadcast everywhere. And so in Matthew 18, the instruction of the Lord Jesus is first go to the, the offender, go to the, go to the one who's offended you, and then go with two. And the last course is take it to the whole church right it's always the last step it's not the first step it's the last step here this is the man's first step it straight away he takes it to all the tribes of israel and so again as we learn about assembly discipline from this we want to contain the thing we don't want it to be broadcast and we want to go to the individual personally if he does not receive that then we go with a brother who is also can witness to it right and two or three witnesses and then finally we take it to the church last resort 
certainly the gruesome packages that had been received had had a desired effect. There was truly revulsion concerning the sin of Gibeah that united them. We might ask this question, are we revolted, absolutely revolted by sin, or are we fascinated by it? It was a revulsion to them when they heard of the sin of Gibeah. And it should revolt us. We should have a holy, uh, just a, just be wholly revolted uh, at sin. But instead, what I find is often we're fascinated by it. The book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 32, is a very interesting verse. And I've often thought about this. It says, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Instead of being revolted by these sins, people actually have pleasure in those that do them. And I think that this is the recipe for much of the soap operas on television, much of the movies produced by Hollywood, is that people, even people that know better, actually find pleasure in watching other people sin. Oh, Lord, deliver us from finding our pleasure in delighting in watching other people's sin we should be revolted by it we should if we were close to god we'd realize how offensive this is to a holy god and so we should have that attitude and it's interesting i was saying the other morning that we're all interested in pleasure there's sin which has pleasure for a season but there's eternal pleasure psalm 16 says at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore so we're all interested in pleasure, and we can either decide we want temporary pleasure that is only seasonal and actually results in devastation and death, or we can, we can bask ourselves and our minds in those things of eternal pleasure, the things of God, the things of eternity, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But certainly there was a revulsion concerning the sin of Gibeah, and again, it's very disappointing that this same unity was not experienced throughout the period of the book of Judges. And there wasn't the same outrage of idolatry in the tribe of Dan as there was as of this sin. And again, we got to ask ourselves, what, what, why is it that uh, this kind of sin revolts us, but the very fact that uh, God is, is being abandoned in favor of idols does not have the same effect upon us? And it really should. If we were really closer to the heart of God, the things that are on his heart would be on our heart. And so certainly that's the case. Notice it says that the children of Israel went out and the congregation were gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba. So from the top of the nation all the way to the bottom. Remember, Dan now has gone up to the far north. Dan even to Beersheba with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. There's two Mispers, uh, and one of them is in the land of Benjamin. And that's where they were. They'd gone to Mispah in the land of Benjamin. And the reason they'd gone to the, there, that's, that was the source of the trouble. And that's always the place to go, to go to the source of the trouble. You know, we think in Antioch, uh, when, when these Judaizers came and tried to undermine the work, uh, where was Saul and Barnabas sent? Back to Jerusalem, because that was the source of the error. And so they went to the source of the error. Uh, they gathered together unto the Lord in Mizpah. And it says, the chief of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew swords. So again, just gives an extent of this. Uh, 400,000 warriors gathered together here now, men that drew sword. And yet the tragedy is, uh, again, that phrase, men that drew sword, they're, they're ready to use that sword, but who are they going to use it against? It's against their brethren. The sword, we, we need to be careful that we're not, we recognize who the real enemy is. And it's against their brethren, this sword is going to be used. It says, now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, tell us how was this wickedness? So it came to Benjamin's attention of this gathering, uh, evidently the, the 12 uh, pieces of the woman's body, uh, Benjamin didn't get that parcel post. Would have gone to Levi, but it would have gone to all the others as well. So it says the children of Israel now wanted to know 
so they could do something about the outrage. They wanted to know the details. For obvious reasons, Benjamin didn't go up. And also, as we've said later on, chapter 21, verse 8 and 9, there was one other group, and they're very loyal to Benjamin. They're very closely tied to Benjamin, those of Jabez Gilead. And so chapter 21, verse 8 says, they said, what one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mizpah to the Lord? And behold, there came none to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly, for the people were numbered, and behold, there was none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. That's going to have significance for them uh, when we get to chapter 21. But again, they're very closely tied to Benjamin, so they kind of stay with Benjamin. They don't, they don't come uh, to this gathering of the tribes. And it says, the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine have they forced that she is dead. It's very interesting that he omits to mention certain things in his description of the events. He admits to mention that he threw her out to the men. <laughs> he doesn't say that. That there's no evidence that they rose against him or sought to have slain him, although he might have reduced this by the way they treated his concubine. But nevertheless, there was no threat to slay him that we read about in the account. And so the point is this, that as he tells his story, he puts his own particular spin on the story. And isn't that just like us? Have we all not done this at some point? I remember my mother would often say, wait till your father gets home because of some misdemeanor that I'd been involved in. And while I was waiting for dad to get home, I was trying to construct how I could put this in some kind of positive light, how I could make it not look quite as, as daring and, and wicked as it really was. And that every one of us, we're, we were very good at that. He, he exaggerated the idea that they were going to slay him to place himself in the best possible light before the assembly. And here's the problem. We're just not honest before God. That's, that's the, if we're going to ever see revival amongst our assemblies, it will begin when people get real and get honest in the presence of God. Instead of trying to put a positive spin on all of our failure and all of our sin and just get real and just get honest. Well, he puts this positive spin because he wants the sympathy of his brethren. And so verse six, I took my concubine, cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. So he's very swift uh, to judge them and charge them with committing lewdness and folly in Israel. But he, there's no evidence of self-judgment in this man. No, no confession that his lust was what drove him to Gibeah uh, or caused him to be in Gibeah in the first place, uh, that his disloyalty to his concubine. There's no, there's no sense of, I may have ha had a part in this. <laughs> it, it's all the men of Gibeah. Now, of course, we're not saying the men of Gibeah were blameless. Of course, they were, what they did was absolutely wicked. Uh, but we, we often are quick at seeing the sin in others that's very obvious to us and completely blind to our own wickedness. And that's why the Lord says, before you go take the speck out of your brother's eye, what does he say you have to do first? <laughs> Get the log out of your eye, right? In other words, here you going to see another brother and, and he does say, go see your brother. He does say, go get the speck. We're not to not do it, but he said, make sure before you go that you get that big log sticking out of your eye removed first, then go to your brother. And so we have to, we have to be conscious of the need of self-judgment before we ever would be involved in exercising discipline and judgment of another person. So he talks about lewdness and folly. Lewdness is and folly actually are both used in the Bible to speak of sexual perversion. And I wanted just to show you this, uh, although the King James translates it as wickedness in Leviticus, 
uh, the word lewdness, but it's the same word in Hebrew. And I want you just to see this, that in each occurrence, it seems to be in connection with perversion sexually. So let's just notice Leviticus 18, verse 17. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, but they are her near kinsmen, kinswoman. It is wickedness or it is lewdness. It's exactly the same word. Chapter 19. And verse 29, do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. And that's, again, the same idea, lewdness. And chapter 20 and verse 14, and if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness, it's lewdness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness, lewdness among you. And then the word folly, again, used in exactly the same way to do with sexual perversion. Genesis 34 and verse 7. Genesis 34, verse 7. We read this. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter which thing ought not to be done. And so basically it's premarital sex that's involved here and it's called uh, folly. It's uh, again, speaking of sexual immorality. Uh, sadly, it's so prevalent in our culture uh, today that it's almost considered to be normal and it's almost to be considered to be folly by the majority. If somebody keeps themselves pure and chaste until their wedding day, they're considered to be uh, just fools, right? Absolute folly. But in the Bible, uh, it says that people that are involved in this kind of thing. It's it's folly. You know, my son uh, didn't kiss his wife until their wedding day. And uh, uh, of course, everybody thought, you're crazy. It's just so unusual to have that. But there was a first kiss that they ever had was on their wedding day. No personal dis dis displays of affection. And all that there was more of that kind of commitment to purity amongst God's people. It would be a wonderful thing. Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 21. Again, this idea of folly. 22, 21, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And there's lots of other references. Second Samuel uh, 13 Verse 12, I won't I'll just give you the references. We won't take time to look at them. Jeremiah 29, verse 23. So the accusation is that they committed lewdness and folly in Israel. And of course they did. There's no doubt about it. But again, what we're saying is he's very quick to point out their faults, but he's very careful to gloss over any fault on his part. He's the victim here. He's done nothing wrong. And again, that's the tragedy, isn't it? That... Um, there's sin here for sure uh, on both parts, but there's no acknowledgement on the part of the Levite. So he says, behold, verse seven, you are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. It seems like the, the Levite and the children of Israel are simply taken up with the evil that has affected them. In other words, it's, it's affected the whole children of Israel, but there's no thought or no concern about the damage that had been done to God's honor and God's glory. And it is interesting, isn't it, that rarely do we think about our sin in relationship to the honor and glory of God. What, what will become of his great name? Remember the, the words of, Josh, uh, of Joshua when Achan had sinned? And he, his first cry was, Lord, what shall become of thy great name? And so, so often it's all about how's this going to affect me? How's this going to make me look if I'm exposed for my sin? But no thought of 
what will this do to the, the character and holiness of God? Because I am indelibly linked with him. Just as Israel, their very name, it tied them to God. They, they were, the word El, E-L, at the end of Israel, it meant that this nation were identi identified fully with God, with the God of Israel. And we, as Christians, are fully identified with the person of Christ. We're gathered together into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I am blatantly involved in sin, it's not a case of, well, how will that make me look? And of course, it will make me look bad, and it will have all kinds of ramifications and consequences, but what will it do to his great name? You see, unbelievers will say, you see, told you, that man's a Christian, and look at what he did. And we need to just be conscious of this, that it's the glory of God that's at stake here. And it's a very tragic thing. What's sad about this is that there's no sense in verse 7, uh, or sorry, verse, yeah, verse 7 or onwards, where they don't say, this man doesn't say, let's seek God, let's pray, let's wait on the Lord, let's see what counsel he gives. He says, give here your advice and your counsel. In other words, he's looking to the children of Israel to give their advice rather than looking to the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, what shall we do? This great folly has been committed in Israel. Show us what to do. No, there's, in fact, it's not till verse 18 in this chapter that they actually ask his counsel and they've already decided what they're going to do. They just want to know who's going to go first into the battle. And so often that's the way it is, isn't it? We've already made our decision about what we're going to do. And then we ask the Lord to rubber stamp it. After we've figured out ourselves, well, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And then we pray and we say, Lord, would you just bless our, our plans, our endeavors, our cleverness? And that's the way we often are. Instead of falling in the presence of God and saying, God, this terrible thing has happened in our nation. It has affected your name. How can we put this right? What can we do? Lord, what would you have us to do? And that's a great place to be at. If we could only get there. But often it's the last call of call. Like I said, verse 18, they finally get there. And they don't even ask correctly then. And, and it's really going to take a couple of defeats before they begin to ask biblically for the Lord to help them. We need to be sure to do that. The other thing that we notice too is that they failed to corroborate the story they just believed him and the particular spin he put on it leaving because it left him whiter than white and so that's what they, they just believed him instead of well doing some investigation uh, what about the man that he stayed with uh, do we have any testimony from other people in giddy you know we're not supposed to do things unless we have two or three witnesses then everything should be established. And Proverbs 18, 17 says, whatever you do, you don't listen to the first person that comes to you. You get the, all the story because the first person that comes always seems just in his own cause, right? We need to know all the facts. If we're going to make a right, wise judgment, we need to know all the facts. And sadly, they acted based on one man's testimony, which was a spin. There was truth in it, but it wasn't the whole truth. And they were going to act on that. They didn't even seek the counsel of God until later. And as a result of their failure to do things in a right way, the whole thing escalates. It all gets blown up. And so verse 8, all the people arose as one man saying, we will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now... This shall be the thing which we will do to give you. We will go up by lot against it, and we will take 10 men of 100. I want to just stop there because I want you just to notice the, the amount of self-will in this portion. Five times, we will, we will, we will, we will, we will. And self-will is always the wrong thing. They've already ter determined their course of action. This unity that they have now is against the brethren. And the children of Israel, they gather together in verse 1, 
Uh, they're acting together in verse 8 in unity. The people are rose as one man. In verse 11, uh, we see again this idea there as one man rising up, acting together as one man. There's complete unity, but tragically, this unity is directed against their brethren. And that's the tragedy, isn't it? But what unifies them is how they can meet out discipline to their brethren. And yet, where's been, where has the unity been in driving out the Canaanites? Where has the unity been in fighting their real enemies? It, it, it's not been there. In fact, remember the Song of Deborah, if you can remember that far back in Judges chapter 5. And a lot of the tribes weren't willing to come. They, they were by the seashore. They, they had great searchings of heart, but they wouldn't come. They wouldn't come to fight the enemy, but they're here ready to fight the brethren. And they're eager. Brethren fighting against brethren can only ever end in disaster. Lest ye bow, fight, uh, bite and devour one another. And of course, we need to remember that one of the chief strategies of our enemy is to divide and conquer. He loves to do it. He, he, if he can get us fighting each other, in one sense, he, we're leaving him alone. Our fight is that we're to take the fight to him. We're, we're to plunder his kingdom. And yet he loves it when we're so busy fighting each other because he's left to do his thing. And so this is his strategy. He knows it well. He knows exactly how to do this. And of course, Amalek always shows up in these occasions and the flesh gets involved. The Lord said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. Luke 11, 17. Oh, how we should love one another with a pure heart fervently. But sadly, we often end up biting and devouring one another. Lord, help us. Help us on this call in all of our assemblies. Help us to love the brethren. Help us to not be constantly biting and devouring one another because it's devastating and we're actually basically playing into the enemy's hands. There's been a sad history of internal strife and division amongst the Lord's people. And often it's led us to be spiritually impoverished and weakened. Notice too, it says in verse 8, all the people rose as one man saying, we will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house, which again highlights the early stages of this incident, very early in the book of Judges, because there's still people living in tents. They haven't driven out all the Canaanites. They haven't vanquished all their enemies. Some of them are still living in tents. Others have got houses, but they're they're not fully permanent house dwellers yet. So again, it, it highlights the early stages of this. This is not following chronologically from chapter 16. We're going back to the early days. We're going to see that more clearly in the later in the chapter when Phineas is brought before us, and it will show us how early on this is really taking place. But we said that the tragedy of these verses is the fivefold use of we will. There's no attempt at this stage to determine what God's will is. The actions are hasty, not waiting on the Lord for direction. It was, a, it was just a case of, we will do this. And so often, that's us. We're just like that. If we decide what we're going to do. We don't wait on the Lord. It's because it's so hard to wait on the Lord, because we're so impatient and very hard for us to, to wait on the Lord. They don't sense that it's the sin of Israel, but it's the sin of Gibeah. If they had felt that it was the sin of Israel, they would have all been on their faces before God, confessing it as their own sin. There was natural indignation about that which was manifestly wicked, but it was not really the fruit of communion with God, because if it really had been, they would have all been on their faces, and they would have, like Daniel, and like Ezra, and like Moses, 
they would have confessed their sin, their own sin as the sin of the nation. And so often uh, we, we need to recognize that why, is, why are our assemblies in the condition they're in? Well, I'm a part of the problem. I can't be always blaming it on the elders or blaming it on this brother or that brother. No, I'm a part of the problem. We were just talking this week about diatrophies and, and the problem in assemblies with diatrophies leaders. And they're very prevalent, sadly, in our circles. But it's not just diatrophies' fault. It's the fault of other brethren who will not stand up and be the man and confront this brother and not allow him to be the bully, lovingly confront him. And you see, they can only exist when, when other men don't step up and don't take their, their place and say, no, brother, we're not going this direction. And so, again, we're all part of the problem here. And, and when we see failure and sin and we confess it, let's do what Daniel did. Lord, we have sinned. We have sinned. I'm part of this. I'm part of the mess that current assembly testimony is in, and so are you. And so let's not be blaming everybody else. Let's own our own responsibility in failure. One of the things that they were concerned to do is make sure that the army that had been mustered to execute this judgment against Benjamin was properly fed. And we notice in verse 10, they take 10% of the army uh, to make sure that they have proper food supplies. Of course, logistics is part of the military issue, isn't it? Uh, how, how do we feed the army? How do we keep them fed so that they have energy? Because uh, I'm assuming that being in a battle, you burn up a lot of calories. And so we've got to keep, you know, an army has to march on its stomach. Now, that's not a biblical <laughs> scriptural verse here but it's true and so it says verse 10 we will take 10 men of a hundred throughout all the tribe of israel a hundred of a thousand a thousand out of ten thousand to fetch little for the people that they may that they may do when they come to gibeah of benjamin according to all the folly that they have wrought in israel in other words in order to be successful in that battle we have to make sure that the army are properly fed and in a right condition to deal with this problem. And of course, we would say too, that the saints of God, to be effective soldiers, need to be properly nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. First Timothy 4 verse 6. And if we're going to be effective warriors for the Lord Jesus, we must be fed a proper diet. That's why the local assembly, it's so important that elders make sure that they feed the flock of God. Because how can we go to war when we don't have nourishment? And there's nothing more nourishing for the saints than the words of faith and of good doctrine. And so this is vital. This is part of our spiritual vitality is having the right food good spiritual food to nourish us to be able to go to battle. In verse 11, it says, so all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. The third time in this chapter, the expression as one man occurs. <laughs> the Israelites were knit together as a unit. Because when discipline is to be done in the New Testament church, unity is also an, an essential aspect, isn't it? If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we said that there's, there's a few parallels that we can observe here in terms of assembly discipline when we think of what is taking place in the, the nation of Israel at this time. And so verse 4 and 5, it says this, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so the whole assembly, it's, it's that phrase again, when you're gathered together. So discipline is not an elder's action. It's an assembly action. 
Now, obviously, elders guide the process, but it's the whole assembly because it's the whole assembly that receives, right? When somebody's received into fellowship, it's brought before the whole assembly and they all receive. And then with somebody, and again, discipline is the last step in a process, not the first step, it's the last step. But the ver all other attempts have failed. And then the whole assembly is to put away from them. And it's to be a unified corporate action. Tragically, so often, emotions and sentimentality get in the way. And people feel a bit of a loyalty. Like, this guy was my friend, you know? And, and so I don't want to stand up and be involved in this discipline. And so discipline, and again, we just want to say this, it should always be exercised in love for the person. And of course, for the honor of the Lord Jesus in the testimony, but with a motive of complete restoration. It's not a case of, we've got to get rid of this brother. No, we want this brother to come to true repentance so we can have his fellowship back with us again. But it must be a united action. And we can't allow our emotions or our past friendships to get in the way if the, if the sin is clear and the man is unrepentant for his good, for his benefit. We must exercise this discipline and we must be unified as we do it. Again, I want to say that something that is blatantly obvious in its lack in these verses, from verse 8 all the way through verse uh, 12, uh, verse 11, they're all acting as one man, but they're all acting on the basis of we will, and there's a complete absence of prayer in this whole process. Also, there's no mourning, no national mourning, that life in Israel had reached such an all-time low. And again, if I could ask you to look once more at 1 Corinthians 5, I want you to notice that something that goes along with assembly discipline is there should be mourning. We don't talk, we all want to be happy. We want happy meetings. We all want to be, you know, everybody wants to be happy and there's no sense of mourning. But it says, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 5, you're puffed up. And have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. And there should be deep, deep mourning. And there should have been deep mourning in this, this terrible event that has occurred in, in Israel. Because what are the pagans thinking about this? See, see, what are the unsaved world saying? You know, they're not a redeemed people. Uh, they're not a people in a covenant relationship with Jehovah. And this sin that we've said is like Sodom's sin has taken place amongst God's people. And there's the, the people of Israel come together. They've got it all planned out. They're not asking God's advice. And there's no sense of national mourning. I wonder how popular would it be if we as an assembly called a meeting to mourn? for our failure, to have a time of brokenness and repentance. I think that would be the most popular meeting for months, won't it? No, no, no. Instead, we're going to have a potluck supper or a skit night or I don't know, whatever silly things that people do. Instead of coming before God and saying, God, we're failed. We're lampstands and we're meant to shine brightly in this community. And we're meant to be a testament to the name of the Lord Jesus. And this sin amongst us has marred that testimony. And we come together in brokenness and repentance. And there's none of this. You know, it's so important to not only act correctly, to do the right thing, but to do it in a spiritual manner. So often we do the right thing, but it's done in a very unspiritual way. And, oh, I just, I see more and more that you have to have spiritual brethren to make New Testament principles work. It, it doesn't work with carnal saints. It just doesn't. And, and so we have to ask ourselves, am, am I walking in communion with God? Am I a man who's filled with the Holy Spirit? Because, because that's what the assembly needs. Men and women that are walking 
under the control of the Holy Spirit, that are in love with the Lord Jesus, and that are completely dependent on him. It's the only way New Testament Christianity will ever work. It's not going to work with carnal believers. It's a disaster. We cannot make it work. And so we need spiritual men. So tragically, we've got this, this awful scene. Unity, but unity against the brethren. Unity uh, without seeking the Lord's face in any of this, how we should deal with this. Yes, they're right. They want to put folly away from Israel. That's a right thing. But are they doing it in the right way? And so often we seek to do the right thing, but we do it in the wrong way. And it's always a shame. So verse 13, it says, uh, verse 12, the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin saying, what wickedness is this that is done among you? Now, therefore, deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. So this is a positive step. Instead of going straight to war, since the children of Gibeah were part of the tribe of Benjamin, they asked the tribe of Benjamin to hand over the offenders that they might be put to death so that this folly might be put away from Israel. So these guilty people, uh, what should have happened is that they should have been stoned to death for their sin in order to, as it were, clean or purge Israel from this sin. So capital punishment is clearly prescribed. That's what they should have done. And these uh, leaders should have handed over the guilty party. I want you just to look at a couple of examples where this idea is communicated in the, the scriptures. They're, they are being biblical in what they're asking. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 5, it says, And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. And so this idea of you've got to put evil away from the midst of you. Deuteronomy 21. Again, we've looked here already. Uh, but it's a very important chapter in the idea of putting evil away from you. 21 verse 21. Again, it says, And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die, so that thou shalt put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Of course, that's the per reason for discipline, isn't it? Uh, why we discipline somebody, why we put them out of fellowship is so that others may learn and others may fear. And they might not think I can sin with impunity and get away with it. And if we fail to discipline, people get the impression that, well, you can be involved in a, a fornication relationship. You can even be involved in an incestual fornication relationship and be treated as one of the brothers. And so discipline is so that this does not happen. Spiritual leaders should always take care not to mar the entire testimony of a local assembly when dealing with a specific issue. And so the wise woman of Abel comes before us as an example. Remember, Joab has come. Uh, he's, he's after the, the rebel, and he's going to pull the entire city down to get the one guilty person. And what the wise woman of Abel said is, why, why would you destroy the whole for the one guilty? And so tell us who the guilty, we'll give him to you. And so remember, she, she throws this man over the wall and she prevented uh, indiscriminate destruction of an entire city in dealing with one errant man, Sheba. And so as we deal with discipline, we want to deal with the person who's guilty, but we've got to be careful that the process doesn't destroy the whole assembly. And that's a very important thing. And so the other tribes of Israel did the right thing in asking the tribe of Benjamin to deliver up the men who committed this crime. 
that would have resolved the crisis right there. The tribe of Benjamin would still have been one of the largest tribes in the nation. But the tribe of Benjamin committed a great sin by putting loyalty to their tribe before loyalty to the Lord. This is the great sin. And notice it says in verse 13 again, Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, the worthless men which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death, put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. And so often, why church discipline fails is because we have loyalty to blood relatives. And sadly, in one sense, but it's a nice thing, but it's not a nice thing. All of our assemblies, we're all intermarried. We need some new blood, actually. We need to get some more people saved and, you know, or else we're going to become like the Amish because we're, we're all intermarried. And the problem is then there are all these relationships. And so if you're going to discipline somebody, <laughs> well, that's my cousin. That's my sister. That's my brother. And so I, my loyalty to kith and kin is greater than my loyalty to the Lord and his honor. And that's what the Benjamites did. Blood was thicker than water in their case. But for us, yes, blood should be thicker than water, but it should be the blood of Christ and our loyalty to the Savior that makes us act rather than just this sympathy for our family. And I've seen it. I've seen things happen in assemblies where it should have been taken care of, but the person was a relative. And so everything was done very easy and they weren't properly disciplined. And on the other hand, there was someone else who had no connection and they were treated both biblically, uh, but they were put out. And this is not the way it ought to be. And it, it caused civil war in Israel. Their personal relationships clouded their judgment. How often is our personal relationships cloud our judgment in doing the right thing? Because we have great sympathy for our kith and kin, and we don't want to see them hurt. And so we think we're protecting them, whereas actually the purpose of the discipline is for their benefit. It is for their blessing. It is for their restoration. It is for their good. Actually, we're not helping them by trying to protect them. We're doing the very opposite, and it's tragic. Put away evil from Israel. Again, we'll keep drawing links with First Corinthians, and we must do it once more because I think this is this is at least the you know, the parallel idea uh, is this idea of church discipline in First Corinthians five verse eleven and twelve. It says, "But now." I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortionist and such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. And so there's this responsibility. Like Benjamin, they should have judged them that were within and they failed to judge those that were within. Uh, verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If this is left undealt with, it's going to have a negative effect on the testimony. And so they failed to deal with what was necessary to be dealt with. This sin in the nation of Israel, uh, they loyalty to their kinfolk was greater than their loyalty to the glory and honor of the Lord. And, and by the way, it's very clear um, that in the New Testament assembly, there should be a clear demarcation between those that are within and those that are without. It's very clear. There's, there's a within, those in fellowship, there's a without, those that are not in fellowship. And it should be clear. It's certainly should be clear because how can you discipline someone who is not really properly received? How can you put somebody out if they've never really been welcomed in? And so this is all, you know, if we get the, if we get the reception wrong, then we'll get discipline wrong. 
these things are all interconnected truths. And our time is gone, but I trust that there's a lot of sobering things here, uh, brothers and sisters, that we need to think about. And most of all, I think the big thing here is loyalty to the person of Christ should supersede all other loyalties. And our failure to do that is not a good thing. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.